This is a special PAX East 2020 review. Namco Bandai's Tower of Juaga for the Famicom. Yes, this is a Japanese import I'm holding in my hands. Circa 1985, it is a direct port of its original 84 arcade coin-op. And don't think I'm not aware that there's an anime series based on this franchise, The Aegis of Uruk. And again, since this is a Japanese import, you'll never guess what I'm about to resort to. See that chip in the back? Yep, that's my trusty converter. <laughs> As usual, before we get on with this, I'd like to acknowledge the following groups and individuals at this time. Brooklyn Interactive Group and Somerville Media Center, Boston Open Screen, looking at you Atwood, Healy and Van Voorhees, Mike Lindquist from Wayland, Michelle Wan from Newton Highlands, Cambridge Community TV, Belmont Media Center, Arlington Community Media Incorporated, James Rolfe and Mike Matei from Cine Massacre, Bitbar Salem, Girl with Yellow Spoon from LA, and Plum Drop 11 from Tewksbury, Boston 8-Bit, Tryheart, Sam Mulligan, Geek Beat Radio, Ian Bergeson from 16-Bit Heroes in the Offseason, Hailing from Merrimack, New Hampshire, Amber Hughes, Kara Voxney from Indiana, Michelle or Autumn if you will, Bales, aka Old School Gamer Mama from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, XBit Gaming, Online Dating Coaches Sammy Moa and Moa Bossi, The Mount Vernon Kid, Java Slovakia, Blasphemous HD, Farrah Garland, Samantha Ross from Your Ultimate Wingman, Boston District 8 City Councilor Kenzie Bach, Bernie Sanders, Matt and Sarah Stone from Clovis, Matt Lister from Dover, and finally, Hannah Heckman McKenna, also from New Hampshire, and Kaylee M.T. Tran, originally from Nashville, now residing in L.A. With those out of our system, let's peruse our main premise, shall we? Inspired by Babylonian and Sumerian mythos, a destined heroic golden armor-clad knight by the name of Gilgamesh, aka Gil, has been chosen to rescue the fair maiden Kai and retrieve the blue crystal rod. How, one might ask? By traversing up the endless 60-floor castle inhabited by the grotesque and aggressive hostile parties led by the demonic specter Druaga, as well as discovering and taking advantage of the most important and valuable treasures, if in some cases the opposite, along the way. In terms of gameplay, in this top view maze crawling marathon of mayhem, akin to Falcom's ease, the short lived T and Esoft's Hydlide, and especially fucking Zelda, despite all of them being predated by what we're dealing with, you're in control of the young Gil as he not only scours his way through each dungeon floor, but also confronts a multitude of adversaries, about whom and which I'll discuss in no time flat and obtains a special item within the treasure chest, for which is mandatory, if again in some cases unnecessary, before proceeding up to the next floor and so on. Control-wise, as typical of any Top View journey, interior or exterior, the D-pad commands Gil's movement wherever and whenever appropriate, and upon holding down B and or A, his sword extends as a means to sling any of said adversaries, while releasing either of them disperses it, thereby leaving you vulnerable to all threats in every goddamn area, except against the wizard's magic incantations, since your shield deflects them. Should your ass get hit a single time, by the way, expect a Viking funeral in your honor, or in this case, a Babylonian funeral. Ditto if you run out of time. Regarding the ample as ball selection of items you'll find in each chest, along with the key to access the next floor via the designated pre-locked gate, no less, there's the copper pickaxe, with which Gil can break down walls only twice, whereas the silver pickaxe breaks down walls more times than that, but both can be replaced upon nabbing a chest, the winged jet boots for much faster traveling than normal, the healing potion for awarding Gil an extra life. However, there's also a variation that drains his life to shit, resulting in an instant death, in which case, avoid it like a goddamn virus. The chime for alerting Gil of the key's exact location if he spaces away from it, predating the radio from Boomer's adventure by half a decade. The candle for revealing the randomly roaming ghost on later floors. The power potion for withstanding more damage against and from knights. The gauntlet and hyper gauntlet for upping the speed of Gil's sword drawing abilities, the latter of which can be acquired by first obtaining the balance. And take special note, the balance has to be in your possession after obtaining the original gauntlet, otherwise it'll transform into the evil gauntlet. Likewise for some of the other armor pieces. 
various swords including the White Sword, Dragon Slayer, and the Excalibur, each stronger than the fucking last, and all of which are mandatory to find and acquire each next type thereafter, the Book of Light and the Bible for illuminating even the darkest floors, the Key and Gate Detection books for locating keys necessary for accessing the next floor, and gates leading to further floors, respectively, multicolored necklaces and rings for protection against dangerous incantations from wizards, you name it, the multicolored crystal rods, and the ruby mace. And holy shit, if you're to stand any chance of leaving every floor unscathed with a majority of these items, there's certain steps that need to be taken, some of which include killing off enemies in a specific order, forcing the timer to run itself out, drawing your sword at a specific location, or having an initially less than satisfactory item and or weapon in possession before replacing it with a more suitable variation of said item or weapon in question. Enemy lineup-wise, there's multicolored slimes, typical of any Japanese RPG-themed adventure, looking at you Dragon Warrior aka Dragon Quest, not to mention knights, mages, sorcerers, druids, and wizards, whose incantations are varied based on not only color, but mainly strength, ghost mages, the holy dragon Quokes, and its two multicolored counterparts, black and silver dragons, will-o'-wisps, ropers, and of course, Draga himself. Of course, you need the blue crystal rod and the ruby mace to approach and defeat his demonic ass, respectively. Otherwise, consider yourself in deep shit flavored Kim Gigi Gay, seasoned in animal dander, and Jeff Bridges' own pubic hair. Aside from the latter indicated titular enemy, unless you're mindful enough of how to handle yourself against every hostile party, regardless of stature, power level, what have us, and what items to have in your possession, or avoid like a goddamn Category 5 storm to further advance, your chances of fulfilling your most destined quest are up the ass of a diseased West Indian manatee after being brutally sodomized by a chain smoking whore with Down Syndrome from Toledo, Ohio. In short, and consider this my final reiteration, apart from finding the key, always get the necessary treasure item to further advance by killing off the required amounts of enemies and or doing so in a specific order depending on the situation of every single tower floor stage area, while doing your damnedest to avoid any pointless items or unexpected, unnecessary damage. As far as the controls go, despite how long they take to acclimatize oneself with and how decrepit they feel at certain instances, specifically when whipping out or disengaging your sword, and shit no, this definitely has piss all to do with private part exposure, period. Honestly, what the hell's the matter with this world? In reality, they're nothing short of by the numbers, and as monotonous and exasperating as the gameplay procedure is, paraphrasing Lester Burnham from American Beauty, it's a commercial for said resulting conditions when it's anything but, not gonna fucking lie. Challenge-wise, as opposed to every other Top View maze crawler out there, if you're expecting a cutesy, casual, and leisurely tribulation out of Tower of Juraga, HOLY SHIT SPEWING FUCK BUCKETS YOU'VE COME TO THE WRONG GODDAMN PLACE! Seriously, it'll twist off your head and spike it onto the floors of a nightmare you can't even imagine, and will dance with you inside the six-sided ring of fire, unless you get the gist of every motherfucking quirk Tower of Juraga will throw your way without any end whatsoever! Since the map structures and the locations of each key, exit gate, and treasure chest are randomized between floors and between every gameplay session, it's up to your own intuition-laden approaches to not only find every last one of them, but to yet again make every adversary your eternal bitch in hell before they do the same to your little gold-plated ass. In addition, don't kill either Ishtar or Kai while facing Juraga, or break any walls on the 60th and final floor, let alone leave without slaying Juraga, or you'll end up being warped back down a goddamn floor! While you're only limited to two lives per game, more of which, who could've guessed, can be acquired by scoring extra points, you're free to continue from your previous floor from the title upon getting ransacked, but at least the key items and equipment you've acquired are still intact, thank god! Beyond that, as ever, take every other hint I've administered into account so far, over which I'm in no position to beat a dead motherfucking horse at this juncture, and do yourself a humble-ass favor. REFER TO A FUCKING GUIDE! As far as graphics, who the hell could've motherfucking guessed? For yet another Famicom game from three and a half decades ago, not to mention one very popular in Japan, but not so much, oh, I don't know, globally? Anyways, overreaction aside, the presentation is sparse as all get out due to the repetitive floor designs, considering how random the wall structures are generated in between each gameplay session, but are made up for, if not by a lot, thanks to the appearance of not only just Gil himself, but also most of the opposing adversaries he confronts, the finale supporting characters, and the differentiating items that he acquires, not just the key. But then again, and forgive the sudden cockiness on my part, graphics don't make a decent game, right? As far as music and sound, 
composed by Junko Ozawa of Dig Dug 2, The Quest of Kai, The Return of Ishtar, Rolling Thunder, Sky Kid and Pac-Mania fame, and the late Nobuyuki Onogi of New Rally X, Galaga, Pole Position 1 and 2, Mappy and Mappy Land, Metro Cross and Family Circuit fame, based on the former's original arcade soundtrack. With all due respect to their efforts and accolades, it's with a huge barrel of regret to announce that I have no other alternative but to look the other way regarding the arrangement of songs for each scene and or interstitial event, not just between floors, but when Gil dies and or makes any unexpected mistakes near the end. While most of the main themes for each set of floors have their somehow convincing moments, after a while they'll drone over you like an ongoing argument caused by a pissed off significant other, and the sound effects don't even get me started. But at least they're not that much of an immediate interference. Replayability wise, while it's arguable as all hell that it's not recommended for mastering or casually experimenting with, depending on the basis of interest in terms of gaming history, nostalgia, or just one flat out severe chaotic round after another of corporal masochism, and taking every stumbling block into consideration that'll drive even the most curious consumers to throw their controller to the wall as often as constantly banging one's head to the very same. Namco Bandai's Tower of Druaga, whose initial intent was to prove that the Famicom was making its transition from simple aspirts of earlier arcade titles to full-fledged, long-winded adventure game titles, amongst many other objectives, should be worth giving a shot or two, but heed my fair suggestion, I'd only do so in moderation if I were you. Therefore, what's my final verdict? It's easy to see why, apart from being popular in Japan at the time, hence those two earlier addressed anime series that were adapted, Namco Bandai was attempting to integrate something different with this particular title. And did I forget to mention that the original arcade version is available in Namco Museum Volume 3, with its sequel Return of Ishtar in Volume 4, both on PS1, a Famicom-only prequel, hence the aforementioned Quest of Kai, released three years later, a Super Famicom graphical adventure follow-up, The Blue Crystal Rod, and even The Nightmare of Draga on PS2, released both six years later and a decade thereafter respectively, with the Extreme Ladder also making its appearance in the US as well, but I digress. Anyways, if you've got the patience, steady mind, and top-notch intuition to withstand the worst it has to offer, look no further than Tower of Juraga, or avoid it like a quarantine, your choice. Granted, it might overwhelm many challenge-hungry addicts every now and again, but on the same token, never fails to stimulate your senses as to keep pressing the Christ on. Online auction prices range from 2 bucks or less to roughly 12 bucks. Admittedly dirt cheap, but still worth the adventure and then some. Until then, my most beloved folks, this is the one and only hardcore retro guy triumphantly signing off. <laughs>